Okay, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for joining us all uh, here today. Uh, my name is Jan Kellett uh, of UNDP, uh, leading the global uh, practice of uh, insurance and risk financing, uh, a growing area of work, um, uh, certainly hardly matching the growing needs. And that's really why we're here uh, at this conference together with our friends and partners from both government and industry. In today's ev uh, event, what we're going to do is really focus on what is the role of, I will just pause for a moment. We can, we can match the sound. Um, our, real fo our focus today is to actually look at um, essentially what is the role of industry in, in, in light of where we are with the rising risks and to an extent the rising crisis associated with the risks when it comes 
to climate change. So what I would like to do to start off our event today is welcome uh, Dr. Khalida Bouzan, who's the Assistant Secretary General and uh, UNDP Director for the Arab States to give some opening remarks. Khalida, please. I will not be able to stay at the end. I have other commitments, and I do have a full briefing all day long, so hold me in suspense. Um, I will not tell you that Africa is the one that, that is most suffering. We have been hearing that the situation is dire, and we all know that, so I will not repeat that. But I think it's very important to, uh, to look at the cost of inaction and how much we will lose if we don't do anything. If you look at the GDP, According to uh, our report, it says that 15% of the GDP will be lost because of the impact of climate change by 2030. So this is measurable. And unfortunately, the cost of inaction will be much higher than the cost of action. So we need to do something about it. Now, if we look also at, at some issues, we look very often at climate change as an issue of renewable energy, access to energy that I would like to put on the table, especially where I sit, as the issue of water. Water is really scarce in the Arab states. The, uh, the demand will increase and the water will decrease. But if we look at, uh, at more numbers, uh, a recent study done by WMO shows that 700 people will be displaced across the continent due to water scarcity. So we see here a direct link between climate change, drought, water, water scarcity, displacement, and I would like to add food insecurity because of the lack and the freeze of agricultural uh, uh, production. So having said that, uh, I would like to link to insurance, which is very important to bear in mind. So one of the, the challenges is how the insurance is, uh, is given uh, to poor and uh, already vulnerable farmers, for example. And uh, in our report, we, uh, you know that you have a flagship, you have the Healing Development Report that is published every year. The global report this year, shows, uh, which was entirely focused on uncertainty, shows that three solutions to this uncertainty could be helping us to come out of uncertainty. And they are investment, innovation, and insurance. So it's very interesting that this is recognized in at the global uh, level. But uh, we know also that the insurance industry also ha uh, holds almost one third of the world capital. So the money is there. So how do we use the money? I think this is an important thing. alone. I think the insurance uh, uh, industry needs very much collateral or, uh, organizations that can help the industry, but also we need uh, member states in the driving and in the driving seat. We have, uh, we have the insurance and risk uh, finance facility currently working in 20 uh, 33 countries, providing solutions to our country office, but also to government. And partnership is at the heart of our work wherever we go, whatever we work on. So, uh, and this uh, insurance is, is also to boost SME financial protection and financing insurance uh, innovation and also contributing to leaving no one behind with an impact. So, uh, I know we are not coming from the same uh, context and you might think I'm speaking another language. So maybe I can give you a few examples to illustrate what I'm saying. So if, if I, I mention Yemen, you know that how Yemen is food insecure, how poverty is increasing day af after day. The, uh, the crisis that we are living with in Ukraine is further exacerbating po uh, food insecurity, increasing poverty. So uh, against this, there is a simple low-hanging fruit that we have been working together as a bureau and also uh, with you. And uh, this is to look at how we can reduce the cost of ships docking in the ports of Yemen. In doing so, we have the potential to remove 250 million f 
of animal cost of food in the country. Uh, and this would mean what? This would mean that the transport will be cheaper, the food will be cheaper, which means it will be more affordable and it will combat poverty at the same time and will be more inclusive. So this is the type of initiative we, we support because we don't believe that insurance are only to insure cars, but they are also here to help us to help the countries that are in need, like Yemen, which is very, uh, very important and very poor uh, country. Now, uh, I would like to have a special mention to the tripartite agreement. This is a unique initiative uh, that is financed and guided by the German government. Please don't speak. Yeah. Uh, and organized through the Insurance Development Forum that builds the financial resilience of communities and countries around the world. We have now uh, operations in 22 countries. I'm looking at you, I'm checking if I'm saying the right thing. <laughs> That's okay, <laughs> Khalida, you're, you're on time. <laughs> Um, I hope you can hear me. It brings the risk finance solution and risk capacity of 15 of the largest insurance companies and UNDP to develop innovation solutions to protect at-risk people, agriculture, and public assets. If we look at uh, Algeria, we are helping them also to develop tailor-made um, risk uh, pro transfer uh, solutions covering a range of areas that are not only affected uh, Algeria, but affecting other countries. So we help to upscale, and these are, for example, wildfire and drought, but also in the case of Algeria, which is specific, earthquakes. Just here, uh, yesterday at COP27, a combined industry UNDP team, together with BMZ and the Lagos uh, government, we launched another project that will, if all goes well, inshallah, if I can use my own terminology, financially protect 8.5 million people against flood risks. And here I think it's very important to uh, look at insurance at a manner to protect countries and poor people against the loss and damages. I think it's important to make this link. We have another project in Ghana and it's a pleasure to have uh, with us uh, Dr. Kokofu and uh, welcome from the Ghanaian Environmental Protection Agency, which that project will pro protect hundreds of thousands of people also from flood risks. And we have seen that not only in your country, but recently in Pakistan. The projections are certainly uh, are clear and, um, and the flood risks are, ris are growing in, uh, in both these areas due to climate change. But this project will do their part to build the resilience of the people and the also to protect the public assets to increase the climate risks. We, we support these projects and more. This is what we do through our colleagues. But this is also embedded in our day-to-day -day work. Um, we have also, for example, if I may mention Sudan, we started with a, a, risk, um, a climate change risk scheme at the local level. Because it was successful, this project that was started at the local level was upscaled and became a policy. And here I want to also to put on the table, if I may, um, we need in, in, in developing these risk insurances, I think we need to take into consideration the context. If you take the case of Sudan, one of the challenge was to what type of financing we can use. And there was a bottleneck because they wanted Islamic financing. So this is why I think it's very important we join forces to make sure that the solution put on the table are really adapted to the context. So I hope we can make a call for action for all of us here today to do more, to leverage our collective resources, skills, capacities, and partnerships to tackle this climate emergency. It's not a fatality. We can make it, and but we cannot make it alone. We need to make it together. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Khalida. Um, I believe you, you have to depart. Do you need to do that now? Yes, I okay. am very sorry. I feel awful, but I would love to stay with you. But uh, unforeseen circumstances. Thank you very much. Good luck. Uh, th thank you very much, Khalida. Uh, 
So we have a, a little bit of a call to action there. I just wanted to add a few further statistics, if I may, talking about why this is relevant maybe to the insurance side of things. So insurance penetration rates, let's talk about practicalities in Sub-Saharan Africa, 2.5%. We did our own estimation of, uh, of the Arab states of the northern parts of, of the continent, 1.5% uh, insurance penetration of GDP. So both very low. Um, statistics have shown, just as an indication of how much there is to do, this is again Sub-Saharan Africa, this being an African COP, that uh, as many as 95, maybe even 97 of every hundredth person in Sub-Saharan sub Africa does not have any single insurance policy, not one of any kind. So if anyone can ask us what is the work that is needed and what is the gap, that is one estimate of it right there. Uh, beyond the protection gap, which is even in the 90% for most of the developing world. Now, what I'd like to do is to hand over to, we have a sort of two-paneled uh, structure here. I'm going to hand over to my, my friend and colleague, uh, Ekeswe Iahen, the Secretary General of the Insurance Development Forum, to take us through the first panel, introduce the guests, etc. Okay, thank you very much, Jan. I, I, I hope you can hear me. I will try and shout. I don't usually shout, but I will try and shout. Um, it's great to see so many familiar faces uh, in the audience. I think this microphone might be working a bit better. Try. Okay, is this better? Yeah. Okay, it's great to see so many familiar faces in the uh, audience, but it's also great to see new faces, right? Uh, because this year we are also seeing, you know, a conversation around adaptation and resilience, which for the first time is really featuring so strongly within the climate uh, negotiations process. And as part of that, we're also hearing a lot about insurance, resilience, risk, etc. So for me, this session is really about, yes, uh, giving you insight into what does that mean in the context of adaptation and resilience and the broader conversations that are happening. Why is that? quite obvious for the instant CBC that being in certain events is absolutely key. You know, we are among the industries within the financial services, probably the industry who will suffer more directly from the effects of what may go wrong in this plan. So that is something on which we definitely need the famous hybrid situation of being part of the financial services industry but being the one exposed to the results of the decision that we do not take is giving us uh, a very positive situation to be very active and to, to be very, very motivated. I've heard something which is for me very important. I think what we can do is also defining a price tag of the decision we take or the price tag of the decision we do not take. They never are mentioned in a, in a, in a key, key way, and I think we need to insist on that aspect. 
The other dimension that the influence can bring is the notion that the money you pay before is three, four times more efficient than the money you pay after. It doesn't need to be systematically a premium to an insurer. It can be also a money to invest in the infrastructure to prevent from the bad results of an event. But this dimension of the money invested before, which is the key of the insurance industry, which is the soul of what we are doing, is very, very important. And I'm not trying to chase the money to make of them a premium of insurance, but I, I believe that we spent 90% of the money of case of catastrophe after the event. We would spend this 90% before, it would be five times more efficient. And that is something we should keep in mind. And then you need also to make sure that you do what you need to do in order to attract, if I may say, the, pub the private sector. And one of the first story that you need to do is, and it's a terrible word, but it, it has to be applied, is the modeling. Because if you do the modeling, you can establish some products, we can be, can be sold at national level, uh, who are definitively also helping the financial sector to understand the risk that you are covering, and do allow you probably to create financial products which also help you to free up some resources, some financial resources in this dimension. So this modeling effort which we are doing at the IDF is something very important because big principles we all agree on. But why doesn't it happen? And it doesn't happen because we probably do not have enough models in some countries to address and to attract the appetite of the private sector. And probably we need to develop a little bit more the new technology in order to address the famous micro-insurance dimension. For me, it's a game from the top with the states. Why are the states never insured? I ask myself. There's no limitation to that. And there is also an effort to be done from a technological standpoint from the bottom by insuring more people, by simply helping them to have access to insurance through something which is a little bit more simple than what we have done in the West, having an insurance agent, an aspect like that. New technology do allow us to do that. And these two dimensions are definitely very key to attract the private sector capital in all these wonderful adventure and endeavor. Thank you, thank you very much, Michelle, for that. You emphasize the importance of risk modeling to bring transparency, I guess, to risk, which should help to allow capital to flow based on better understanding. But you also touched on a point, which is the insistence on ex ante preparation, right? Taking the time beforehand to think about the risks that we face and also the investments that we need to make in terms of risk reduction, but also the preparation of finance in order to deal and make our society deal with the kind of shocks that we are seeing and make our societies more resilient. I think that these are critical points um, in this venture. But again, I would like to turn to a more national perspective, <laughs> um, Dr. Farid. Currently, there is a new insurance law um, that is about to be approved by the government of Egypt. How does this law support the support the insurance sector and how will this support Egypt's broader development agenda in the context of what um, Michelle has, has touched on? Um, uh, thank you very much and it is one of the few times whereby you can be shouting and no one will be annoyed from you so uh, I'll keep shouting as much as I can so that you can hear me here. Um, b before maybe delving into the new law that uh, the unified insurance law that's the name of the law that already the government has approved it is now being discussed in the second house of the parliament so it, it went through the upper house the house of lords and now it is being discussed in the parliament itself in the house of commons of egypt so uh, this unified law and before delving into it uh, i believe plenty of people here need to know what is the FRA of egypt the financial regulatory authority i believe does anyone know here apart from the people that i know in the in the in the room uh, knows what is, what is the fra it is the single regulator for all non-bank financial services from a conduct micro prudential and macro prudential perspective so basically it is the regulator of insurance sector private pension funds microfinance consumer finance mortgage finance capital markets and derivatives so we have a twin tower regulatory approach in egypt whereby the banking sector is being supervised from a conduct and prudential and stability from the Central Bank of Egypt, and all non-bank financial services is being and markets are being regulated 
from conduct and as well prudential and stability from the FRA of Egypt. So that to put into context what is the FRA uh, dealing with and why maybe we are here today. Um, the new law has, has several important aspects that uh, supposedly should increase the penetration ratio that you mentioned. Uh, the figures that you mentioned for Egypt is even lower than the sub-Saharan ones and the North African ones. So we are on the lower end of penetration ratios when it comes to insurance, despite having a very historic and long-standing history in the insurance market in Egypt. We have some companies that can be dated back to even more than 100 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. So despite this, we still have the penetration ratio, not as we aspire for as regulators and not as we aspire for as the country in general. So the laws in Egypt that has been governing the private pension funds and the insurance companies dated back to 1975 and 1981. Plenty of implementation problems has showed that required to have a unified insurance law that is governing the private pension funds and as well insurance companies with the different types of insurance, property and casualty, life insurance, and an added component that was not there before, which is uh, health insurance uh, and uh, the, the uh, th third party, sorry? and the micro insurance as well. So adding new aspects that should add to the penetration ratio of, uh, of the insurance sector. But one important dimension is having mandatory insurance that can be stipulated by the regulator in some of the professions. So for example, if you're going to deal with an auditing firm in, in the UK, uh, they will need to provide you with an insurance certificate, which is a professional certificate on the profession. We don't have this in Egypt. So we'll be having valuation of companies, firms, but you don't have this insurance. You will be having insurance brokers, but you don't have this type of insurance product on it. You will be having brokers companies uh, for securities but they don't have uh, 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 professional insurance on their activity so starting point to try to mitigate the point of a low penetration ratio and to protect as well people is to have several mandatory components that became compulsory uh, insured against such as the professional uh, functions that we're mentioning in addition to uh, for the private pension funds is to expand th uh, uh, the possibility of the entities that are establishing private pension funds not only to be within their area or the, the, the domicile of the company that is establishing the private pension fund. No, they can now, with the new law to be, uh, to be promulgated by the president, hopefully, and approved by the parliament, to be sold even abroad. So here you are adding to the function of the private pension funds as if they are more of an investment function as well. So this should add as well the capacity of private pension funds to expand beyond the, the sphere that they can be selling their investment certificates for. Going back to the problem that we have and to be implementable because ultimately you need to deal with the private sector, ask them what do they need to be able to uh, uh, participate in the risk components that we are be talking about, that we are talking about today. The first and foremost, and to be covering the financial modeling, is the data. So you need to know the loss ratios of farms. You need to know the products and how they're going to be implemented. So before even thinking of the modeling of risk, we need to have the data associated with it and to be accurate data to be modeling it. And that's why one of the areas that we're going to discuss extensively with the Insurance Federation of, of uh, with the Egyptian Insurance Federation is some data that we found it is being there across uh, the continent, continent of Africa to expand agricultural insurance. Because if you're trying to mitigate or, uh, or have uh, adaptation uh, insurance for the, the farmers, the problem we don't have it in Egypt. Why is it the case they don't have data and not having the data and b being capable of doing the risk modeling, the, the reinsurers are not participating in this type of product. So one point is to have the data to be able to do the risk modeling and to be able to convince reinsurers in that regard. Another very important component for adaptation risk would be the, the, the invention or uh, reinvigorating connections between capital markets and insurance markets. So for example, one of the areas that we're studying as we speak is to create uh, catastrophe bonds. It is quite well known in some jurisdictions. In some other jurisdictions, they're not quite well known. But the concept of having uh, insurance special purpose vehicles, whereby they, they take the underwritten risk and disperse this risk across capital markets and other insurance players and hence uh, uh, enable those companies to reinsure the risk through special purpose vehicle is of paramount importance and this would be your route 
to be able to ensure against uh, catast catastrophe, floods, all of these aspects. And while doing so, it's not only a matter of ensuring the risk. I agree 100% that the money spent before the incident is very much more important. Because of the discipline that you will be having, because you're underwriting or uh, securitizing this type of risk to special purpose vehicles, probably you will have some discipline in uh, uh, seeing how you're dealing with the floods in terms of farms, seeing all of these uh, different aspects that would add discipline, quality, and money spent before the incident trying to mitigate the different types of risks that we're seeing. This is a nutshell. The, the law should be expanding the mandatory insurance and compulsory insurance and hence increasing the penetration rate extensively. Uh, reliance on technology is one of the clear points in the, in the law uh, because nowadays it would be ridiculous in a country like Egypt that has a, po a population of 70% uh, of the population less than, uh, than 40 years old and to be asking them to go in the traditional route of going and sitting in the office trying to underwrite the, and sign the insurance contract and while they cannot spend seven, uh, seven seconds of focus on a video so basically you need to capture their attention and to grasp them and and for them to underwrite in your products in a very ingenious ways and relying on technology so this is uh, in a nutshell uh, what we're doing thank you yeah thank you dr farid you've touched on so many different topics uh, that i think are so important uh, from risk modeling to also the architecture that surrounds the insurance industry and the discipline that it introduces. And for me, that's a really important point because the, the, the issue that Jan raised in terms of insurance penetration rates across Africa and developing countries is that that same architecture that exists in many developed markets doesn't exist in many developing countries. And so it's a process of building that at the same time that we are trying to make protection available for people, for infrastructure, etc. And so it's good to hear about the law that you are, that's being passed in Egypt because it's an attempt to try to tackle all of these issues. From the regulatory to how do you think about distribution, how do you think about risk modeling, how does that connect with other um, elements of the financial um, sector. So thank you for that intervention. I'd like to ask uh, another question. So this is a very complex issue. We touched on issues that are at the sovereign level, why governments uh, don't insure, to issues around microinsurance. What are the key challenges when you think about public-private partnerships um, in the context of insurance? We heard about a tripartite program. So um, it would be great to hear from you, Michelle, what you see are some of the challenges um, around public-private partnerships um, in this space. You know, the, the big risk if you are an insurer, you, you start to make your computing, you have a lot of actuaries, I have an enormous respect for the actuaries, but you're a little bit far from, from actually the purpose of your role. And I think this kind of events, and I, the cooperation with the NDP is something which is extremely important to give us in our comfortable offices, computing our famous formula, the sense of urgency we need to really address the, the, the gap and to address this gap in, in, a, in a genuine fashion. And I, uh, I definitely believe that these kind of meetings are connecting the private sector and it's his request in, in potential sustainable financial solution with the urgency of what happens on the front. And, uh, and this bridge is precisely the modeling bridge, is precisely a few of these things that we need to apply country by country with a lot of modesty, starting with little cases, but realizing in few countries, the famous tripartite in, in the few countries in which it is it has started, give us the example which can be replicated then in other places. I think the key element is first, realize the urgency to make of our nice financial computing something which is really relieving people. And the second one is to lend at the country level to find solutions. They may be small at the beginning, but everything started small and then they will be efficient. You see, if we, if we continue to speak about big principles, we won't achieve a lot. And that's what I like in the concreteness of this tripartite that you mentioned, Ecosway, because in each of the country in which we try, we do not try the same way everywhere, but we try in a way that is applicable in this country. And with each time more example of this type of penetration, we will reduce the protection gap, which is key not only for our business plan, it's key for the planet. Thank you very much, Michelle. So I'll turn to you, Dr. Uh, Henry um, Kokofu. 
Uh, I'd like, you've heard a lot from Michelle, public-private partnerships getting very operational to some of the regulatory dimensions that you have to take into consideration when building the architecture to allow for insurance to play a meaningful role. Um, we know that Ghana is also one of the first countries that uh, you know is part of this tripartite uh, program. And so it would be good to hear your perspectives um, in terms of how you believe that program can actually contribute to the resilience of, of uh, Ghana. Well, thank you very much. Um, I hope I'm heard. Good. Um, Ghana assumed the presidency of the Climate Vulnerable Nations. Uh, forum uh, comprises about 58 countries with 1.4 billion people and among the lot of things we'll be talking about uh, coming down to COP27 had to do with loss and damage as a top priority and here we are talking about um, how do we cushion um, um, ourselves or vulnerable countries from uh, climate impacts so it all boils down to the question of uh, climate financing. Uh, that's where we are. And uh, it always reminds me of the polluter peace principle. Uh, what is happening to it and uh, who pays for the laws and who pays for the damages that uh, do okay. Uh, I will attempt to answer your question uh, in a brief. Uh, yes, um, there is a tripartite agreement uh, which was signed between the government of Ghana and the UNDP. IDF and Alliance uh, that is an insurance industry player uh, within uh, to address uh, the effect of perennial flooding there have been perennial flooding uh, within the cities of Ghana particularly the capital city Accra and a uh, lot of damages are caused life lost and all manner of things and when it happens the government is called upon through the National Disaster Management Organization to come to the aid of the people. And uh, there's an additional uh, unbudgeted for cost on the fiscal space of the government and puts pressure on the, 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 the budget uh, of the year. So uh, the project uh, had come uh, as, 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 uh, as something that, that can... Uh, come in in between and then help the government. Um, we hope that um, the project which involves building a model for flash, um, flood risk with the specifics of the, of the cover jointly developed with the counterparties. Uh, I've said over the years we've been encountering these things and all that. The agreement is, is yet to be fully operationalized but we do hope that once we do so, it will culminate in an insurance product uh, that could be sold to insurers and reinsurers locally, regionally, and internationally uh, for them to uh, come in as, and provide a policy or a model that will help protect the people and the government against risk of flood and all that. Um, we deem this to be a very significant milestone. Um, as we work towards bridging the wide risk gap in Africa in general. Uh, a step towards developing an efficient disaster management mechanism that ensures timely uh, payouts after climate disasters or force majeures. Um, these climate-induced uh, catastrophes do not announce themselves and all that. Um, close by, our neighbors in Cote d'Ivoire, that Cyber Coast, a uh, few months ago, I uh, have started piloting insurance uh, for their rice production sector. And their aim is to uh, have a framework that could be replicated across additional agricultural value chains, such as cotton, maize, and cocoa. And since we are within the same um, geological zone frame, uh, we, we deem it as also a, a positive step that we can uh, uh, look at it and then work with it. Um, by and large, we think uh, there is the need to have a critical climate data for the country and for that matter, all African countries. Um, if uh, we are going to uh, have a, as a, as a, driving, a key driving climate insurance, 
Indeed, closing the insurance protection gap in Africa should be a major priority. So I'm happy when I was told UNDP is uh, holding up this uh, uh, program. Uh, I think it's in the right direction. Um, I want to say that uh, the program like this must also consider expanding to cater for more premium and capital support. Um, two minutes ago, I was in the United States, uh, Washington precisely, and uh, I, I, I witnessed on the television the ravages of uh, Hurricane Ian on Florida. And it was so devastating, um, properties lost and all that. But uh, I could see the comfort within the people that there is a risk gap uh, protection. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a protection uh, for all these loss and damages. So what is it that uh, put in place by way of insurance and social uh, safety networks that is working uh, for the people there? Can we, um, if not at the same scale or the larger scale, uh, in Africa and vulnerable countries begin by, uh, as he said, uh, in a very small, modest manner, how we can develop some of these things uh, to alleviate the pain and the suffering of the very people who are least uh, uh, polluters, uh, I mean, but heavily impacted because of the weaknesses in our systems uh, and, and structure. Um, there is a similar then um, issue resilience uh, global partnership that's co-financing model in Senegal, Ghana, uh, and could benefit from the models where DPs commit to pay premiums directly to the insurer when participants, the beneficiaries, engage in specific activities and also pay subsidized uh, premiums. Uh, these programs are critical if we are truly to reduce the financial protection gap and to ensure that help goes to those who really need it. Um, just this afternoon, I went past the Pakistan, uh, Pakistan's pavilion and I read something very touching. It says, what is happening in Pakistan will not remain in Pakistan. Uh, simply, we are in a ship together. Either um, we save ourselves together or we sink together. So this is the time uh, to find solutions to uh, loss and damage. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm very conscious that there is supposed to be a second panel. <laughs> so I would like to, to wrap this up. And I think that you touched on an important point, which is the point of solidarity. Right? Um, and insurance itself, and the point I'd like to emphasize, is also built on this principle of solidarity. Pooling risks together and finding ways in which we can offer protection to people. So we've not had the extent of time to explore these issues in more depth but i would like to thank honorable uh, uh, panelists for taking a few, a few minutes out of your time to share your thoughts and my hope is that we can continue this conversation with each of you but i would now like to hand over to ivo mensinger to take us into the second segment of this conversation don't don't worry ivo i'm doing that hey echo is handing away jobs Sorry, um, we lost uh, a few members of audience, a few members of panel. The, fir the first is definitely not acceptable. The second is um, absolutely fine. Um, Heike is here. Yes, I, I do realize. Thank you, Ivo. If I could ask Dr. Heike Hen from BMZ to join us on the panel. And if I could ask Ivo Menzinger from Swiss Re to join us on the panel. Um, we have a few more questions. If we could uh, 
settle down in the audience, please. Thank you very much. Uh, so, I need my notes for this to, to find out where we are. I think reflecting on what we've just uh, heard, uh, just a couple of uh, uh, sort of almost logistical points. Uh, Ghana was actually our, f I think, probably the first country we ever talked to about the, uh, about, uh, the tripartite uh, program. Um, two years ago, I'm going to say two years ago, probably. And it was launched in um, April at the IDF summit. Uh, the, Egypt is one of the newest countries. One of the things we, wanted, we reflected on from last night, we had the Nigeria launch last night, which was a, a, a lovely event of, of friends and family from, from this community, um, many of the people are, who are here. And I, I did reflect then that it took two years, two years for that project to reach its fruition. Uh, and there's a lot of work which goes into, into this. Um, so um, just, a, just a point, if you like. What I'd like to do now is go to Dr. Heike Hen, who is the director uh, of the Directorate of Climate, Energy and Environment, the Federal Ministry of, for Economic Cooperation and Development, that we all know easily as BMZ, even though the acronym is German, but that's okay. Um, so this is your question, Heike, if I may. So the government of Germany has spearheaded several initiatives. In fact, I could I'd say much more than that. The German government and BMZ have spearheaded a lot of initiatives in the space of insurance and risk financing to address uh, development challenges and been really a, figure, uh, a figurehead in this space for a number of years. The latest, of course, is the announcement of the Global Shield uh, this week. Um, what we'd like to do now is, to, uh, what I'd like to do is to ask your expectation for what is the public-private partnership side of the Global Shield? How does that fit in? Where does the tripartite fit in, etc.? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jan, uh, and thank you, thank you also for the audience coming back. So we highly appreciate it, Ivo. Is <laughs> so, but it's really a pleasure to be here, and thanks uh, also to the panelists uh, who already laid uh, out uh, what we are talking about, like uh, also in the second panel, because uh, I think also the relevant aspects of this COP, of the conversation now on loss and damage that is in the middle of all conversations and uh, many actors, partners who are now more open to engage. I think this is exactly what we need. And uh, from the German perspective, uh, Jan, you mentioned uh, already our engagement, but I think uh, we look at it, uh, the needs are obvious. So uh, somehow we ask ourselves, why not everybody engages? <laughs> as we do, because we know uh, what is happening right now, what will happen tomorrow, and that we definitely have to team up to uh, really bring the resources to vulnerable people and uh, country before disaster strike, um, and of course after, beca because we cannot uh, pre-arrange everything. But I think this is our approach. Uh, I mean, uh, of course we need mitigation, we need adaptation, but we of course need also to strengthen resilience. And therefore um, we try to um, uh, be bridge builders um, within the negotiations, but also outside, bring partners together, private sector, but also others, other governments uh, talk to the US and others who are maybe not as open um, and also try to find uh, new partners because I think we need all hands on deck to uh, be able to address this. And uh, you were mentioning the Global Shield. Um, this is one of our contributions for COP27. It's one of the solutions outside UNFCCC because we think uh, we need solutions within UNFCCC and outside UNFCCC because uh, the conditions of countries, the challenges are different uh, um, and therefore it's a mosaic of solutions uh, we need. And the Global Shield wants to bring uh, more comprehensive, more sustained, uh, more coordinated and effective uh, support by pre-arranged financing. Um, so, uh, it's not dealing with uh, slow onset events or non-economic losses, but focusing on, uh, on really a country perspective. And I'm very proud, I don't know if Dr. Henry uh, Kokofo is still with us, uh, that we, uh, together with the V20, 
have developed the Global Shield and uh, what he was ex uh, explaining from Ghana is I think so crucial, the experience and the, the knowledge uh, to build in the Global Shield. So um, it has all kind of uh, um, partnerships and we want to build or we want to identify the protection gaps uh, in uh, vulnerable countries and find the most effective uh, solution to close these protection gaps. And having said that, this makes clear that we need different partners because insurance partners uh, can uh, be the perfect solution for some uh, protection gaps. For example, for smallholders against uh, uh, the risk of drought in specific countries. And we need other partners, for example, in the field of social protection uh, schemes, uh, where we, we need really, uh, where the challenge is uh, uh, to get uh, um, uh, cash transfers quickly out to the most vulnerable. And we need other partners um, to, for example, work with uh, climate clauses in lawns uh, because this was also mentioned in, in the other panel, when disaster uh, strikes, the fiscal space often is so limited. So uh, we, we have to free fiscal space uh, from loans and, and, and have a clause that for two years or three years, uh, not loans coming from the Global Shield, we are all about grants, so that is not, a, so not to be mistaken, but to support uh, these kind of clauses, um, to free the fiscal space in countries. So the Global Shield is about prearranged financing. Part is insurance, but we are not only about insurance. So with the data, with the modeling, with, be, with insurance being so quick in the payout, um, and the great experience with the tripartite, uh, working with the Injury Resilience Solutions Fund, uh, also with the uh, Global Risk Modeling Alliance. So there are so many exciting partnerships uh, we have uh, together uh, and we want to integrate it with the other uh, solutions, like I said, social protection, climate clauses, uh, infrastructure bonds, uh, so, so different solutions to really bring impact on the ground quickly. Thank you, Dr. Heike, for that. Um, with that in mind, Evo, I mean, that was a bit of a call to action as well from, from, from Dr. Heike, I think. I would like to ask you this question. Um, so you are obviously a representative of Swiss Re. In fact, your title is Managing Director for Public Sector Business. Is that correct? Last time I checked, yeah. yeah that was, that's your first question. Well done. Oh, well done on that one. Uh, and of course, you are the co-chair of the Sovereign Humanitarian solutions um, working group within the IDF, which actually manages from the IDF and, and industry perspective the tripartite agreement. So the question for you is this. Um, so uh, can you share with us your view on what is needed to fully realize the potential of the insurance industry in this sector? But of all, I'm going to amend the question halfway. I'm going to say, but particularly with reference to the Global Shield and how you can see it fitting in with that. I, I anyways need to respond to what Heike just said uh, because so I completely agree with you. Uh, we need uh, various stakeholders including working with the government for the government social programs. Uh, you mentioned insurance riders or hurricane clauses in, in, um, in sovereign debt issuance for instance. So now the good news is if you talk about the potential of insurance uh, I'm preaching to the converted here in this, in this room, but it is not just about leveraging uh, private balance sheets. It is also about our risk knowledge, the analytics that we can bring to bear. It is about the ability to incentivize risk reduction uh, through you know, uh, 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 adapting the premium to, uh, to the risk. Uh, to the actual risk uh, of individuals and it is about very basic principles such as uh, the uh, uh, ha having rules based payouts uh, that is what an insurance contract is is about and uh, putting these rules uh, rules based payouts in place for prearranged finance is something that can also be used and leveraged 
even if the money comes from the private uh, from the public sector so we have a toolkit which is way beyond you know using our own private balance sheet so while we are talking about social government programs or then insurance riders uh, in uh, sovereign debt issues talk to us we are happy to help even if it does not uh, you know ultimately land on our balance sheet so that's the offer on the table uh, and I think uh, uh, you know it's important that all of us understand that this is the, the, the full potential of what we can bring to bear now uh, the, uh, the to your question more specifically uh, and I will limit my comments to uh, one, uh, one of the work streams that we have, which is about establishing new insurance schemes. Uh, we've gone to a, a number of experiences already, and in order to scale this up, um, I, would, I would mention four uh, items, four elements that, are, that I would like us to think about. Um, one is, it is incredibly hard on the ground to work and establish new insurance scheme greenfield and therefore it is so important, has been so important that we have our friends from UNDP with us. These guys have uh, feet on the ground on almost uh, every country and it is so important to have people in the country working closely with the governments because it's a long process. Jan mentioned two years to get uh, the first agreement in place or one of the agreements in place. So this presence on the ground is important and working with, for instance, the local insurance associations and the local insurance companies and local partners is, is also important. And we need to have more of this. So that's my first uh, dimension of what we need to, uh, to scale up. Secondly, we are a private sector industry. So whatever we do, it needs to make commercial sense. That's just a boundary condition. Philanthropy is great. And uh, you know most insurance companies have their philanthropic CSR activities, but it is not enough to achieve the scale at the speed that is required, uh, and the impact that we want to have. Then, uh, secondly, we need to reduce the frictional costs of actually uh, becoming operational in uh, in countries to work on country programs. We need to make it easier between the public and the private sector uh, to, to work together to, to simplify and streamline. Uh, and I think the, uh, the model that we found under the tripartite of co-investment actually is a great one because it puts us, so to, so to speak, on equal footing. We have an interest to invest and you have an interest to invest. We need to make it as easy as possible in this collaboration. Third point, um, we need to double our efforts on uh, opportunities that allow us to scale uh, much more compared to a single country approach. Otherwise, it will take too long. Uh, I see two elements. One is actually, you mentioned it yourself. So using uh, instruments that every treasury uh, uses, such as issuing debt and implementing uh, insurance features into that has the potential to scale up uh, greatly. Another um, area is, is actually humanitarian financing. So the 24 billion of humanitarian aid that flow after crisis need to be systemically shifted to ex ante. And again, whether or not this goes ultimately on the private balance sheet or not doesn't really matter. It is about the triggers that we can design and bring to the table, the risk modeling and everything. So that's the second item where I think that has the potential to scale. Uh, and the last one that I want to mention is we need to have more trust into each other. I think we are just scratching the surface of collaboration between the public and the private sector, including with the multilateral banks uh, at, at the moment. There's a lot of reform talk about multilateral banks and I would just invite the community that discusses these reforms to involve the private sector much more than it currently does. Can I stop here? Y you may stop. Thank you very much. Um, a, a lot to take away from there. I mean, I have one other small question for us. 
all to ask each other, and I'm going to even be part of that. So I'm going to be part of the panel in a moment. Um, uh, the humanitarian aid, uh, I mean, I s actually one of the jobs I used to do before when I had a sort of stint with UNDP and then I left and then I came back was actually tracking humanitarian assistance. And um, back in 2009 when I started doing that job, uh, humanitarian assistance was $9.1 billion a year. Actually, last year it was 30. I mean, so there is a massive, massive call to action right there. No wonder the, qu the actual emergency system is not sustainable, is not able to deliver. Well, essentially, it's creaking at the seams. And, you know, this is, this is where I think the Global Shield but all other kinds of initiatives have to shift a focus of away from emergency financing. Um, and we all know the benefits of actually financing things in advance, whether we call it anticipatory finance or parametric insurance or whatever it might be. So that's, that's probably not getting enough attention, I think, here at COP because there's the bigger picture of loss and damage, but actually, okay, let's just tackle the fact that actually we spent far too much money financing the same crisis year after year after year using the same financing sources which are not working. Sorry, that, that was a bit egregious of me to use that as a, as a point, but it just came to me uh, as something which we're not, uh, I think, ad addressing here at COP. So here's my um, final little question to us all. This is how it's worded. This is when we had a panel of five. So I'm, I'm just going to read it out anyway because it's quite funny. Uh, it says here, look around the panel. That's, that's us three. So, uh, is there an ask you can direct towards your fellow speakers on what they can do to help realize your vision for public-private partnerships that leverage the potential of the insurance industry from a development agenda? There's a few clauses in that, that question. But I think basically, Dr. Haik, uh, what we want you to do is ask something of this gentleman and then something of me and basically say, you know, what do you need to do and what do you see need to see more or even less of from us? Excellent. Uh, uh, I would uh, propose that we've been asked this question on every, every panel. I think this encourages a uh, frank exchange. So, um, I mean, we are going to launch uh, together with the V20 the Global Shield uh, on Monday in a presumably high-level event that I'm looking forward to. And that's great, and we want to see coverage and so on and so forth. But the great thing about the Global Shield is the action that we want to see. And so um, from both of you, but I come to uh, specific points, we would really, from both partners uh, and everybody else, we really want uh, you to team up with us uh, and be ready for action from the day after the launch. Uh, because uh, uh, this is not about shiny announcement and... Okay. Okay. Um. So this is not about shiny announcement, but about us all working together um, quickly and not like doing three years of studies when after we have a short analysis of what is already there, we could do it in half a month or uh, half a year or three months. Mm. So really be ambitious um, and also um, a sense of collaboration. Because we, we see that uh, too many of us, including a government, stay in their respective corners and, and do not really do the hard thing of coordinating properly. But UNDP or BMZ is continuing doing what we have been doing and it's so difficult to coordinate with what France is doing. Or, uh, so, so, so please uh, leave your comfort zone, uh, us as well, and coordinate. And I think... <laughs> Almost one a round of applause there. Uh, and one last thing, maybe more targeted to you, Ivo, that I also struggle with, is how can we better integrate incentives um, for even action before insurance kicks in and, and not give maybe the wrong impression, oh, I'm insured. Um, so how can we either subsidize premiums, uh, I mean, we, we are subsidizing premiums, but for, for I don't know, uh, having uh, resilience building activities or policies in place. So I think this is with what we envisage that, that we want to scale it up and this is something that we be cautious or aware about, that we, that we set the right incentives. So these are my asks. Over to you now. Thank you very much. I think I've got to go to Evo second. 
Okay. Um, good. We are not we are not expected to respond here and now, right? But Ecosway took note. So. <laughs> I think these are official commitments that are going into the UNFCCC oh right, uh, right. notes for today, gotcha, by the way. Gotcha. No pressure. <coughs> so, Heike, I like that notion of leaving the comfort zone. So, one, one of my asks to the public sector would be uh, where, we are, where we are working with these uh, insurance, de developing insurance schemes. Uh, th this is frontier. So this is new, uh, and uh, it, when you come from the private sector, then when you invest in emerging markets or as venture capitalists, you always calculate that there's a risk of failure as well. So what we uh, are used to do uh, from a private sector perspective is that we, uh, we pour in our resources, but it may very well be that it is not successful, then we try to fail fast, and then we, we, you know, we move on and try the next thing. I think that's a little bit harder for you in the public sector and we see it a bit in the collaboration uh, that we currently have. And if we could just become a bit more entrepreneurial uh, and, and you know, as uh, establishing a failure culture so that even in the project that we do with you, uh, we start earlier and we do not have to clarify everything before we even start the work. So that would be my ask. And I'm happy with John, so no ask for the UNDP. Are you sure? You must have something. Even something small. No? I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Evo. So that was a, a kind of call to action, I guess, there, in terms of the, the way in which the, 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 the funding flows and, and, and so forth. Uh, from a UNDP side, I mean, how do I ask BMZ, which actually is our major financer, a, a question which is either uh, either inappropriate on one way or, the, or dangerous on the other? Okay, I've just got to think about that one. So I'm going to go to Evo first. Uh, so Evo, um, uh, maybe a question is like this. How do we get more companies into the actual tripartite agreement and beyond. So I'm just thinking, and that's also wherever Michelle is, if he's still there. There he is. Um, th th this is a bit of a dangerous ask, but I'm just going to throw it out there. So, uh, you know, we have, what, 16 CEOs at the, on the tripartite, uh, I think, level. I'm not sh on, the, on the steering committee level. Uh, I'm not sure how, if all of them are in the uh, tripartite agreement, but they no, need to be. No, not all of them, but the so we Evo, have how many we, more companies. How do we get them all there? This is, this is your ask. This is uh, my ask. No answer today. <laughs> this is the, that was the deal. You, you, you asked. Oh, I just asked, ask, but there's no answer. Yeah, yeah, oh, all right. right. Well, that's actually yeah. fine. We'll work uh, on Okay, so then I have to go, Dr. Heike, to, to the question to you. Um, and the question is like this. So how would you see um, the Global Shield? No, it's, it's an ask, isn't it? Sorry. Um, so uh, it's, it's a more difficult thing to do, actually. So can we get the Global Shield to, on the one hand, balance what are the needs at the country level and what are the demands at the country level with the ways in which you actually implement at the country level, which may not actually be through just looking at each country right now, right here. But given this is an ask, I guess there is no answer, so... We will take it offline later. But what I did know, actually, we asked the question. We were working with Martin and team, and we actually got this to be resolved within the, within the concept note. Um, so, colleagues, we have come to a close, and I thank you a lot for, for being here. I have four points to end with. First of all, in, in a matter of substance, I think one of the things, it's great to have Dr. Tarek here from the Insurance Federation of Egypt. Great pleasure to be here. I think one of the things which I think is missing, if I might say, within this whole discussion, uh, for example, around loss and damages, is the importance of national insurance markets. So I think it was really interesting to hear from Dr. Farid of all the complexity, and he introduced a lot. So, for example, when we're thinking about insurance solutions and so on, I think most of the instruments, for example, probably the shield and the way it's articulated currently, they don't really respond to that yet. So that's, I think, a learning curve if we're really going to be able to tackle all the layers of risk which are there and also foster national economies and, and growth. So that's just my first point. Uh, my second point is um, perhaps just one of... Uh, I want to go back to the Human Development Report. I would uh, urge all of you to look at it if you have not. 
life essentially in an age of uncertainty and the role of the insurance across investment, insurance and innovation. The insurance industry is doing all of those and we need to see certainly more of it. One of the most startling statistics out of the report uh, is that six out of every seventh person on the planet currently, those surveyed, are living in a heightened state of uncertainty. Six out of every seventh person, that's basically most of us in the room. So, well, you know, one of the other things that insurance does, if it's done well, uh, Evo, you, you mentioned a few of them in terms of the product and the, and the analysis and, and so forth and the risk modeling, is, you know, stripping away some of that uncertainty. Maybe not all of it, but if we can build the right kind of products and the right kinds of tools and work with the national insurers so they can do so as well with uh, the growth of industry, then maybe we can strip away one or two of these people of that, of that statistic and actually strip away some of that uncertainty because that's at the core. If you look at the report, for example, and you look at the impact of uncertainty, for example, and a trust deficit, extremism, all kinds of things which are coming out of that, it's actually quite scary. So there's another call to action there as well. And then, but as I want to end on, a, on a, end on a positive note, if I may. So we talked about the tripartite agreement. We have the, some of the parties here and we have Egypt represented as well. Um, uh, so we estimate, we estimate that the first 20 countries of the tripartite agreement are going to uh, provide financial protection if all goes well. That's a caveat Evo taught me. Uh, 80 million people with financial protection, which is a massive, massive thing. Little round of applause. Thank you very much. And as I mentioned yesterday in the signing for Nigeria, that is uh, an entire 20% that the global community committed at the UN Secretary General's um, uh, Climate Summit in 2019. 20% from one single program, but of course involving many actors, many countries and many projects. And with that, thank you very much for all of your time. Enjoy. We had to slightly wing things. I hope it wasn't too uh, uncomfortable. Essentially, the entire running order uh, did not run. So uh, that. Uh,